with my Samela Mafumo. Mark Thompson. Make it kind. Get woke. God bless you. Get woke. Folks, MIP is now COVID free, meaning free to all subscribers as we navigate this pandemic. We're thinking about everyone and we've got to get through this together. So for a limited time, no fee to subscribe to make it plain on your favorite podcast app. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today is a professor of women, gender, sexuality studies at UMass Amherst. She is the author of How All Politics Became Reproductive Politics, From Welfare Reform to Foreclosure to Trump, Somebody's Children, The Politics of Transracial and Transnational Adoption, and Reproducing Empire, Race, Sex, Science, and U.S. Imperialism in Puerto Rico. I can tell from those titles, she's a bad woman. So we scared <laughs> her. Yeah, she don't play. All right, we're gonna. this is gonna be fun. Uh, her latest is Taking Children, a history of American terror. Uh, professor Laura Briggs joins us now. Is it is it professor or doctor? Professor is just fine. Professor is fine. How are you, professor? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I'm just fine. I'm reading just some of your titles there. We we might have some of the same nemeses out here. Uh, you you pushing some buttons, I'm sure. <laughs> that's that's my job. <laughs> that's one trying to make the right if i'm not making the right wing angry i'm not doing my job right <laughs> right that's right that's wonderful I'm, I'm thankful for you so we want to talk about uh taking children and of course the book talks about uh the history of oppression in this country especially when it's come to african-american and native and latinx children but let's start in the present because something interesting you raise um, evidence of institutional racism affecting children and families seen through various relief and regulatory programs in response to COVID. And so since COVID is right here upon us, and frankly, I mean, there are no real signs, despite what Trump says, there aren't many signs going to abate anytime soon. Um, talk to us, um, about that when it comes to uh, 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 children and families? Sure. Um, well, especially as we know, in places where people are in institutions, congregate settings, nursing homes, prisons, and refugee shelters, um, COVID is very contagious. And in Chicago, the, there's a health and human services detainee shelter that's continued to hold detained um, refugee kids, um, even in light of a COVID epidemic that sickened at least 37 children. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that's happening that's, um, that's really changed the scene for, uh, for immigrant and refugee children is what we saw in 2018 and 2019 was an exodus from Central America where people were fleeing um, police and other kinds of violence, um, state violence and violence by cartels. And now if they enter the United States, they are immediately being deported. Yeah. And so, the Trump administration was able to accomplish finally what it actually set out to do in 2018 and 2019, which is end effectively the existence of a legal asylum program. So since March 10th, uh, March 20th, rather, 2020, literally two people have been granted asylum hearings. Mm, mm, yeah. So, so that's been a, an impact. You mentioned the, the, the ICE detention centers. Um, children are being put in facilities that 
may not be safe for them in the middle of this pandemic, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, I mean, they've never been safe, right? Yeah, right we right. had <laughs> children in 2019 right. dying of flu. Yeah. Um, so, but they've become dramatically less safe, of course, because of the landscape with COVID. And I'm sure we don't know, there's probably not transparent documentation or transparency on, on what's happening to some of these children, right? That's right. There's a Texas program, Grassroots Leadership, that's reporting that ICE is not reporting COVID cases. And so the T. Don Hooten Hudo Detention Center apparently has at least six active cases of COVID and the and ICE has not reported that. Mm -hmm. um, so you also cite, so the NYPD here in New York um, is using social distance enforcement to further criminalize African-Americans, isn't it? That's right. That's absolutely right. And you, we know that while the police are one face of a system, every time a community, a person is getting criminalized, and especially if they're being put in detention or in prison or in jail, um, that has effects downstream on children. Mm -hmm. um, so what we've seen with mass incarceration since the late 1970s is a doubling of the size of the foster care system um, in places like New York and all over the country because criminalization also comes with, um, with foster care. You chronicle, and if you talk to us about this, how, and this gets a little bit into the history of American terror, how the foster, the expansion of the foster care system was used to put down the black freedom movement. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked about that. I don't think enough people know this story. Um, so in the 1950s and 60s, of course, black children were in many ways at the forefront of the black freedom fight from school desegregation to the Children's March in Birmingham to the, um, the bombing of the Baptist church in, in Birmingham that killed three little girls, four little girls. But, and as a result, um, white citizens councils, governors, uh, the KKK, white supremacist organizations, were trying to figure out what are the leverage points, what are the weak points that can terrorize a community that's in rebellion. And so we were talking about Birmingham. What we saw in Birmingham was the cutting off of, of mothers and children, single mothers and children from welfare. The welfare budget for the city of Birmingham was halved in the late 50s. But the other thing that happened, and the forefront of this battle was in New Orleans, is when school desegregation orders came down from the federal government, of course, the position of white governors and legislators was, um, all, was to resist that in every way that they could. Mm -hmm. And so in 1960 in New Orleans, they targeted children who were identified as um, illegitimate children who were, whose mothers were not married to their fathers. And this means people in common law marriages, people are widowed, people are divorced, and said, these children are illegitimate, and thus they are living in immoral homes and should not be allowed to go to public school. So they banned them from public school and they cut them off from welfare. Mm. And... That meant that single mothers had no way to feed their children anymore. And National Urban League, of all, of all the folks, right, the most conservative of the national black organizations, in 1960 began an international campaign for, that it called Feed the Babies. 
asking people to send money for rent and for um, and for food. Churches cooked for these families. Tens of thousands of families were supported through this national and international relief effort as the governor and legislature tried to terrorize people essentially into leaving New Orleans, leaving Louisiana, and no longer participating in school desegregation efforts. Mm -hmm. And so this was the most dramatic of, of incidents that happened all over the South. Mm. Single moms were the opposite of the respectable black middle class dressed up in their Sunday best, represented by, um, by people like Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. And so they wanted to essentially humiliate the movement by saying, no, see, there are all these immoral women and children, and tried to terrorize these women into relinquishing their children. Mm. And that was the period that some people called um, the browning of child welfare. That's when child welfare became a program that overwhelmingly was about taking black and brown children. Mm -hmm. um, there was also, uh, well, let's go back even, even further. I mean, this, this as soon as um, the settler colonialists arrived here in the United States, it was all about terrorizing families and natives vis-a-vis -vis their children, wasn't it? That's right. And throughout the, throughout the period of the 18th and 19th century, we saw Native people pushed off their land and successively pushed further and further west. Mm -hmm. And by the late 19th century, by the 1880s, a population that had once been maybe as large as 20 million people was reduced to a million people. It was very much a genocidal policy. And by the 1880s, the U.S. Cavalry was looking for a way to put an end to the Indian Wars. They'd pushed them as far west as they intended to. People were concentrated mostly in Oklahoma um, and a handful of reservations distributed through the west. And so what they did was they said, We've got, we're going to take these kids as hostages for the good behavior of their people, which meant not going to war with the cavalry anymore. And so that's how the boarding school movement started. Boarding schools were originally started by, uh, by a colonel in the cavalry. And children were taken from their families and communities. They were forced to speak English. They were only occasionally allowed home, if at all. And of course, we know that there, were, that there was terrible illness and death, as well as simply growing up without parents through um, the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Mm. And people never stopped resisting that. There mm. were stories from the 1930s of um, of people going on to the Navajo reservation and literally rounding up children and hog tying them like cattle and putting them in trucks to get them to go to these boarding schools back east. Um, um, and it's interesting because you talk about the disease back then. Yes, certainly that was real then. And that's almost like, you know, deja vu today, you know, using illness as a, as a form of control uh, and, and manipulation. Um, I think we're in a much better position to understand what our ancestors dealt with when they thought of concentrating people in institutions. They thought of children dying mm -hmm. in the same way that we're now grappling with the same thing under COVID. Yeah. You know, speaking of children, too, you know, um, Trump likes to run around and say Pocahontas all the time. With really re what I realize and what he's saying, I mean, it's become this Disney myth, mythical fairy tale. But the record suggests Pocahontas herself was a child. You know, she was young. And so too young to be the age of consent to be in some exclusive relationship with, <laughs> with John Smith. 
so, you know, it's kind of uh, 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 revealing that, that Pope, I mean, that Trump leans on that, um, you know, knowing his history with, with young women and the beauty pageants and all that. I've told Elizabeth Warren, she hadn't listened to me yet. I said, when he calls you Pocahontas, you need to call him Honky Potus. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> See, you'd be a much funnier presidential candidate than Elizabeth Warren ever was. <laughs> and like, Mark, I can't do that. But, you know, so, 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 so Laura, if you ever hear her slip up and say it, you know, when you plant some of them, you ever see them say honky potas, anybody else that say Mark, Mark's the one who planted that seed. So hopefully it'll take one day. But, um, uh, but I mean, that, that in and of itself is an example uh, to me. I, I don't take that as just some something to say, because I don't see the Disney thing. I see what was really going on and, and children being taken from families, obviously, too. Uh, we know what happened in, during slavery in the Middle Passage. I mean, we, my ancestors were treated like animals and separated from their mothers, uh, sometimes from at birth, even, mm -hmm. even on the ship or once they, um, once they got here. Um, but, but you talk about also internationally, talk to us about what the United States was doing in terms of taking and separating children uh, during, uh, in, in its, fights with Central America, uh, allegedly trying to stop communism. That's right. So when we think about 2018 and Central American children being taken at the border by um, the Stephen Miller wing of the Trump administration, we need to know that that's got a history, mm -hmm. that Central Americans were made into people who could lose their children. Um, through the presence of uh, the involvement of the U.S. in wars in Central America throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Mm -hmm. And we sometimes tell the story about how Argentina and countries in that southern part of South America had a program of separating children from their parents as part of anti-communism the right-wing government in Argentina in particular, that's the story we know the best. But we don't know the story that is much more rooted in our own U.S. history, which is the disappearance of children in El Salvador and Guatemala, um, where the U.S. military was very involved in training, um, particularly in Salvador, uh, training military personnel through the School of the Americas. And some of the people who were, um, who were most involved in atrocities were graduates of the School of, America, School of the Americas. Mm -hmm. And parents, again, have never stopped looking for the children lost in the 1980s. Some of them were adopted to places like Spain and even the United States. Mm. They've found some of them. Um, they have, in Guatemala, they've sometimes found them in nearby communities. Right, Guatemala is a country of many indigenous peoples with 14 first languages. Mm -hmm. So you can lose a child to an upbringing in a different language, even if they're only a few hundred miles away. Mm -hmm. And so what those families in their activism to find their children have reconstructed is an organized policy by anti-communist soldiers and paramilitaries to stop the transmission of culture, to stop the transmission of language, and to, uh, to prevent another generation of reds, right? Another generation of people who, who rejected free trade and capitalism and the organization of the government for the wealthy. And, they've, and they have linked those, um, they've linked the military leadership back to the U.S. School of the Americas. We don't have final confirmation that the U.S. was involved, but there's certainly a strong sense that the U.S. was at least aware that militaries and paramilitaries were systematically disrupting, um, disrupt, oh, taking children and 
that they may have encouraged it or at least looked the other way. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I, I, I doubt, I mean, I, I'm sure of that. You, you also cite the whole issue around crack babies. When, right. when, um, when Barbara Bush died, I was in the unfortunate position of being on the set of MSNBC. And so they were coming to people who were there. So Mark, what do you think about Barbara Bush? And you know, you don't like to speak ill of the dead, right? When it's announced Laura, but you can imagine I was in a spot because you can probably tell Bushes, I wasn't a big fan of the Bushes, oh God. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and, and, but you know, what Barbara did, which was interesting, she was in that directly, the crack piece. I was living in DC at the time. Barbara and her husband were in the White House. And when the, the, the crack baby thing just blew up and there were allegedly these crack babies just left behind in all these hospitals in DC, especially Howard University, <clears throat> Barbara Bush was calling every prominent and rich family she knew, even a few black upper middle class, upper middle class families. Oh, you got to go adopt one of these crack babies. I mean, I, I saw that firsthand. Mm -hmm. You got to adopt one of these crack babies. Now, um, a lot of those babies at her request were adopted and raised in families outside their birth families. I mean, I don't know what that meant or what happened to the parents. And, you know, I'm sure there was a lot there, but she was involved in that whole thing to go and, and, and rescue and adopt crack babies. That in and of itself was a whole thing, wasn't it? The whole crack, th crack baby thing had, so many levels of involvement it, by the U.S. government. So, how what was crack? How is crack cocaine getting to the United States? Right, it's not grown here. Um, and what are the thing? What are the first things we learned about how crack was getting to the United States through the San Jose Mercury News and Gary Webb is that. Reagan and Bush, through their support of the Contra War, were allowing, looking the other way, as Contra pilots flew arms south to Nicaragua or Honduras, and they didn't return with empty planes. They returned with, um, with cocaine that had come from Colombia. And so Central America, that's how Central America became a huge transshipment point for for crack and then when it got to the United States and came in through Miami and came in through Southern California um, after sort of building the cartels in Mexico that have now played a role in the displacement of hundreds of thousands of Central Americans um, in recent years what we saw was the hyper criminalization of anybody who is using crack or cocaine yeah and we know from that since nixon it's been a strategy of the u.s government and u.s policing to identify drugs with the black community specifically so that in order to oppose the black community's political role in um in opposing nixon and other republicans yeah and Reagan intensified that. Yeah. So then we've got Reagan trying to end welfare. What, is, what does he do? He turns the same lens, or he and his administration turn the same lens on women and children, just like the White Citizens Councils had in the 50s and 60s. Right. Um, how do we make black women look really bad? How do we make them look like they're evil people who don't care about their children? We say that if you're using drugs during pregnancy, then you're practically killing your baby, except, um, what was it? Charles Crowdhammer, the neocon um, columnist, still writing, said their mothers will kill them if they're lucky, suggesting that crack made, um, made these fetuses, babies, um, completely uneducable and that they never, you know, Head Start wouldn't help, nothing. Well, the horror of that, I mean, there are many horrors of that, 
hundreds of mothers went to prison, still bleeding from labor, and lost their children um, permanently. Crack, it turns out, has very little or no effect on fetuses. Heroin has an effect on fetuses. Smoke has an effect on fetuses. Maybe alcohol, although le much less than we expect. But this was all a monster story to um, turn black women in particular into terrible mothers to identify them as welfare cheats and um, people who should lose their children. And so crack was part of that wave of mass incarceration that criminalized mothers. The other thing that was part of that same wave was the association of alcohol and fetal alcohol syndrome with native communities and native mothers. And so women, especially girls, young women who were drinking during their pregnancies, wasn't just that they lost their children, although that's horrifying, um, but it was also that they went, again, they went to prison and they were turned into some kind of monsters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the, the criminalizing of parents, the criminalizing of children, um, is it not also true, too, that the prison industrial complex itself and mass incarceration has led to the taking of children, the breaking up of families. And I know in, in the black community, you may have generations of families, fathers, sons, grandsons, uncles, and let's not forget about women, mothers, daughters, aunts, grandmothers in prison. That's right. And as we know, that was a deliberate strategy to disenfranchise, impoverish, and weaken the political power of communities of color. Yeah, yeah. And while men in particular have been criminalized, we could say that the child welfare system, or what Dorothy Roberts more appropriately calls the child taking system, has been its counterpart for women and children. Mm -hmm. That you know, we talk about the greatest pain you can experience as a parent is to lose a child, right? And what we mean by that usually is that your child died because uh, especially for white folks, we don't think of losing children to the state mm. as a common occurrence, right? Because like, some, like other kinds of policing, it is overwhelmingly and disproportionately affected communities of color. Yeah. But it, how is it that we can say um, that the most pain you can experience is to lose a child and not do something to reform a system that has a racially disproportionate impact and that has impacts in families where it's not clear that anything's going on except people are poor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are going into social workers and um, child welfare workers are going into households and saying, well, I don't know what's going on here. I'm, you know, 23. I have no experience with families in terrible trouble, but I can see that there are exposed wires and the, and there's no food in the fridge. So I'm going to take the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but how about, if we restored AFDC? How about if we restored any kind of program that supported mothers and kids, single mothers and kids in particular? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's, and you call it terror, which it really is. The breaking up of the family, the, the trauma that comes from that. Uh, I mean, you can, never, you can never recover from that, really. Um, and again, it goes back to early settling. It goes back to slavery because families did not matter. And one of the ways to demoralize us was to separate us from children, from their parents and parents from their children, never to be seen again. That's right. And terrorizing people on slave plantations by threatening to take their children was one of the primary tactics of slaveholders 
Yeah. And, but it's also important to say, Mark, that there's been, there have been political movements against taking children from the beginning. That the abolitionist movement focused on how gut-wrenching it was to have children sold away. And for a while, in the mid-18th century, from 1830 to 1865, you couldn't turn anywhere without seeing a broadside, something pasted to a wall that was an infant and a child being separated. When Congress passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the anti-slavery amendments, the discussion in Congress was, well, thank God, now we're not going to at least see all those images of children being taken. And I think we saw those exact same images, those exact same memories being pulled on in 2018 when people started organizing against what border patrol was doing and taking the children of asylum seekers and refugees i think the history of the black freedom movement standing up for the single mothers and children who are supposed to be the disreputable people that were supposed to shame these good church-going folks um we've uh, i think Communities of color and especially native communities have stood up for um, for lost children over and over again. Yeah. Um, in 1977, there was a passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act because of a decades long campaign to demand the keeping of native kids in native communities. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, you're right. And glad that resistance has been there. I've had a relationship over the years, uh, professor with the National Association of Black Social Workers. And that was yes. always a big thing for them. In fact, when we had the Million Man March, I mean, obviously there are children, plenty of African American children that actually don't have homes. And we said then, well, if we're going to do this, um, we needed more African-American families to adopt African-American children that were available without homes, um, you know, rather than that. And I know you've also written about the politics of transracial and transnational adoption. That's a whole nother thing. But they said, listen, right. and for a minute, it, there was a spike of black families adopting black children. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's something that 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 we need to continue to address. What are your thoughts about that in, in terms of the ongoing separation of families from children? I mean, obviously we talk about ICE, that problem is solved hopefully with a, with a doggone new president. Uh, I mean, that's pretty much what we need there. Um, Can I stop you there, Mark? Please. I want to go back to the National Association of Black Social Workers oh, please, statement, please, please. But, I, but I want to, um, I want to make sure that we don't leave it, that we need, just need a new president. Please, please. Because it was the first president to separate children at the border was George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan put children alone in detention and refused to let their aunts, uncles, or their cousins come and collect them and terrorize their family members if they were undocumented. So. And the Obama administration, which initially made a huge deal out of how it didn't separate children from their families as the W. Bush administration had done, um, he ultimately, his administration ultimately also put children who arrived unaccompanied in, um, in detention and urge and used expedited removal, which means basically you don't get to make the case that you're seeking asylum. You don't get to provide the documentation that you brought with you to show that you're going to be killed if you go back. And we know that under the Obama administration, some children were killed. Young people were killed when they returned to Central America. Yeah. So I, I, Trump, with Trump, the cruelty is the point, right? With Trump putting Weeping children in front of the cameras was really, uh, I don't know what word to use, fun, amusing. Yeah. Um, Rick Wilson said, you know, some of his followers want anybody who's darker than a latte de deported. Um, 
But even they ultimately learned what the Obama administration knew, which is that weeping children in front of reporters ultimately generates more pushback than it's worth, Mm -hmm. and that they can just do what generations have done, which is criminalize their parents. So in 2019, what um, the ACLU found the uh, Border Patrol had been doing is saying, well, all right, we're not just taking them because we don't want them to apply for asylum anymore. We don't do that. Um, We're taking them because they're criminals or we're taking them because they're neglectful. And we don't have a good history in this country of standing up for parents who are criminalized or parents who are who are called neglectful. Mm-hmm. And so I'm very concerned that even a Biden administration will not necessarily stand up for children and communities and people who are trying to come here under a refugee and asylum law. The, right law that the Trump administration is now using, or the policy, the Plan Frontera Sur, which is to use Mexico to do its enforcement, to stop people before they get to the U.S. border. That's an Obama-era program. That's a program that Biden claimed credit for. So Mm. I have my reservations about how we'll see a different immigration um, regime. Bill Clinton was the person who first started, the president in recent years, who first started criminalizing migration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, But let's go back to the National Association of Black Social Workers, who was so out front in 1973 in saying, where do black children belong? Black children belong with black families. Because while indeed there are children who need families and who can't for whatever reason return to their own families and i'm not you know wholesale disrespecting the foster care system i raised a foster kid myself sure um but i will say that how most children where they wind up where and once they enter foster care most of them go back to their families of origin but that's where the real racial disparate impact is because white children go back a whole lot easier and they go back with housing support they go back with food stamps they go back with support and the and black children are much more likely to be taken and not returned and i think that was what was so important about the um what the national association of black social workers was saying in 73 is that they were looking at the black freedom movement and the criminalization of impoverished black motherhood, basically, and saying, we've got to keep black children with black families. Now, they also did really important work in placing kids who didn't have um, another place to go. And that's a long history. W.E.B. Du Bois talks about little tiny um, households in the reconstruction era where churches would support black kids to not get picked up um, by what were essentially latter-day slave patrollers who would pick them up and drop them off um, to work on chain gangs. Mm. So there's both an incredible history in the black community of any time somebody had any resources um, looking out for black kids whose parents couldn't be around for them but also of that history of the state taking those kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Um, Laura, I appreciate you writing this book and sharing this and then reading some of your other titles. They they let you carry on like that up there on campus at UMass. <laughs> <laughs> UMass has a good, fine, radical history. That's so that's they fine. put up with and us. They put, that's great. That's great. Well, no, this is great, folks. Uh, it, it's I'm I'm audience. If you're like me, you're thankful to get to to meet Laura, and Laura, we'll have to have you back to talk about some of the uh, the other projects you've been working on. Fascinating history and and very helpful. Um, and again, very I, thankful that you've taken this on, folks. Her latest book, "Taking Children: A History of American Terror," um, and folks, that's exactly what it's been. I invite you to check it out. Again, Laura Briggs,
is a professor of women, gender, sexuality studies at University of Massachusetts uh, Amherst. Uh, Laura, just one other thing. Um, I'm sure you're um, um, you're you also pleased with the news out of Supreme Court and its and its ruling on LGBT employees and uh, an, an unexpected victory, I guess. I wish I could be an optimist. Really? I have to tell you that while I, of course, applaud that ruling and am grateful for whatever protections can come to um, LGBT employees, I'm terrified about what that means about the upcoming Supreme Court ruling about DACA. We can look back a few years and remember that the gutting of the Voting Rights Act was coupled with the Windsor case, which um, was a was a gay rights ruling that the Supreme Court enacted. Mm. And I have to say, getting Title VII protections means not that much. And Title VII cases with gender discrimination are lost more often than they're won. And I have to say that that's likely to be the case with LGBT employees. And even more scary to me is something they put in that decision to bring some conservatives on board saying, but religious freedom is a super statute that is going to trump any gay rights ruling here. And so we got a trade of a not very powerful protection for LGBT employees under Title VII in exchange for um, turning Christian, the Christian religious right into having a tool that they can use to trump any federal law, they say. Yeah. Wow. Wow. What, what, tell me about the, the DACA ruling that's pending and, and how this could impact. So the Trump administration, literally since before they took office, has been trying to throw out DACA. Right. Um, which was simply an administrative action by the Obama administration. And surprisingly enough, that has, um, that has held up for three years of the Trump administration, that the protection against deportation, which is all it is, it doesn't legalize anybody, it doesn't give them status in this country, but it means that there is some hesitancy, basically, around deporting young people who were um, seen as the innocent victims of immigration law, right? The innocent, innocent victims of their parents' illegal act in bringing them to the United States. Mind you that it, it's an illegal act that for most of this country's history was not illegal. Um, and so the question... The question is, and I'm actually a signatory on a brief in this case, is whether challenging, um, trying to overturn the administrative action that protects people from deportation is motivated by racial animus, Another, and hence illegal. Um, so is it just racist is the question. And you and I know that's exactly what it is. Yeah. That's all that's at stake here is trying to endanger the lives and futures of black and brown young people. But the Supreme Court is going to consider that question and whether the Trump administration can overturn the Obama administration's actions in DACA. Mm. Well, and we should be hearing about that in the next few weeks. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, that yeah, that that wouldn't be a good thing either. Um, what is though? Because I want to be clear in terms of the foster care system, the adoption system. What is its current status in terms of some of the things we've been talking about? And is has any is anything getting better? Anything changing? What can we do to make it better? So, one of the things that's one of the things that it seems to me where is at stake in the current struggles over policing is finally the defund the police calls um, for from people in the streets demanding an end to the racist violence of the police 
that's getting translated by all sorts of intermediaries and commentary commentators and newspapers and so forth as why are the police doing all these things that we could send a healthcare worker to do? Why are the police showing up for a drug overdose? They're also saying, couldn't we send a social worker a lot of these times? And I'm very nervous about that because at the same time that we have to identify the violence of the police and speak out against it, we have to identify the other coercive power of the state that's been deployed against especially women and children of color, which is often by social workers, welfare workers, these right. other folks who are not cops, right? They're coercive, but they're not explicitly violent. And I don't want to see us replacing one kind of system for, you know, this softer, gentler, coercive, heartbreaking system, right? That separates people who love each other. Mm. Mm, that's a profound point. Yeah, that's definitely a profound point. So we have to keep all of that in mind, even in this conversation about shifting um, responsibility from the police to other agencies. You're absolutely right. Mm. Folks, again, we invite you to check out Taking Children, A History of American Terror with uh, the author, Laura Briggs. Laura, again, we thank you. Keep up the good work. Let's stay in touch too. Love your work. Love your yes. music, love your writing. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thanks so much for having me on, and continue I really enjoyed to give the conversation. Hell. Continue to give them hell. We'll do. Thank you. You <laughs> too. Right. All right. Take All right. Bye right. bye. Bye bye. God, you are our refuge. Send our ancestors to guard our doors. Cast out this virus from our communities and our bodies. Heal, bless, and protect everyone listening and their loved ones. Thank you for listening to Make It Plain and Get Woke. Remember to listen, like, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. If all minds are clear, it has been Made Plain. Made Plain.